welcome everybody. My name is Celine Figueroa from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I will be your virtual host this evening. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science is pleased to partner with the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management and the Denver American Indian Commission to present Indigenous film. As you watch tonight's presentation, go ahead and put any comments or questions that you might have for our amazing panelists in that chat. You might not be able to read each other's chat, but we can see it on our end and we love reading your questions. If you did not have a chance to watch the film, I am putting a link in right now. It's currently being hosted on our museum's YouTube. There was a question about ads. Unfortunately, we are, we're unable to do anything about the ads that YouTube has, um, but that is the way that we're able to provide uh, the, the film for everybody here. To begin tonight's event, I'd like to in introduce Dr. Gabriela Chavarria, Vice President of the Science Division at the Denver Museum of Science. And she is leaving the museum for an amazing opportunity at the end of the month to become the Executive Director at the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture in Seattle, Washington. Gabby, welcome. Thank you, Celine, uh, for, for that. And thank you everybody that has joined us tonight. Um, it is, you know, bittersweet. Uh, it's not a, it's not a goodbye, but, uh, but I'm, you know, I will stay engaged. This has been one of my favorite programs, and I think Jean and Marv can attest. I had, I part, tried to participate in most of them in person, so it was, you know, a really highlight. But tonight, I wanted to welcome you all that are joining uh, the program, uh, together with, you know, the inter, the the great partnership that Denver Museum of Nature and Science has with the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management and with the American Indian Commission. So we're really excited with this partnership. And you know, every month we, we continue to see some incredible films. We have these really great uh, in-depth discussions uh, that you, know, you, will, you will see tonight. And I hope you have a chance to see the film. It is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Oaxaca, Mexican. Oaxaca is one of my favorite states in all Mexico. So anyway, so welcome tonight and I will, you know, I will pass it on to Jean. Welcome everybody. Um, tonight uh, we have our, our program, The Keepers of Corn. Uh, we're really pleased to have this film to kick off our 2022 monthly indigenous film series. We partner, uh, with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and with the Denver American Indian Commission to bring this monthly series to you. Uh, with me is Marv Tano. He is president of our institute and also uh, is a commissioner on the American Indian Commission. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science has been hosting this monthly series since 2015. And we really appreciate all the support we've had from them. Um, and in particular, the, uh, the, their ability to transition us from in-theater programs to this virtual platform. So we've been able to continue uh, providing these programs on a monthly basis. So thank you, DMNS, for all you do for us. I uh, also want to thank our monthly series sponsor, Mile High Behavioral Healthcare, and our media sponsor, Kubo Jazz Radio. You saw their logos. Uh, scrolling on the screen as you logged in. And tonight, a very special thanks to Gabriella. She has been an enthusiastic supporter of our film programs, both as a representative of the museum and on a personal basis as well. She has joined most of our film programs. In fact, we always we always look as as people log in, we we're looking at the participant list and I would say, oh, Gabby's on. <laughs> uh, because we always know she always has some interesting comments or really good questions for our speakers. And I would normally say we'll miss you, but since everybody is virtual, I don't have to say we'll miss you. There will always be a place at the table for you. And so instead of sayonara, we will say hasta luego. <laughs> so I will turn the mic over to Merv. He's going to moderate tonight's program um, with a bit of introduction and he'll bring on our speakers. Uh, but as Celine said, at any point in the discussion, 
you can type your questions into the chat room and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Murph, take it away. Okay, Murph Tano, uh, head of the uh, International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management, uh, we're a law and policy research uh, institute, uh, but we do a heck of a lot of film because film is a good way of introducing some of the uh, law and policy uh, issues uh, that uh, are uh, affecting uh, indigenous peoples uh, throughout the world. And this particular film uh, is one that does exactly that. Uh, it is a film that is, uh, as, as filmmaking, it is terrific. Uh, as a message, it is terrificer from uh, my, my perspective. Uh, let me very quickly introduce uh, uh, the panelists. Uh, we've got Diera uh, Vallejo, Vallejo and uh, Jonathan Barbieri. Uh, uh, and then we have uh, Sergio Rangel. They'll introduce themselves further, uh, say who they are and what they do. Uh, we're going to start off uh, with a, a question to uh, uh, Jonathan and Ira, and then uh, about halfway through, we'll uh, ask a question of, uh, of Sergio. So just very quickly, uh, folks who have worked with us in our roundtables and our workshops uh, uh, understand that I absolutely despise the term traditional knowledge. Okay. Uh, I do not like the term. I do especially do not like how the term has been used by non-Indigenous scientists, basically to cherry pick from Native systems what they feel validates their particular theory. Okay, I much prefer using the term traditional knowledge systems. Uh, for us, it's, it's important to be talking about knowledge systemically. It's about, for us, integrating Western science into traditional knowledge systems and not the other way around. Okay. There's several reasons why I think this is important and why I think this is a, a sounder way to approach uh, the meeting, uh, the confluence of, of different knowledge systems. First, uh, traditional knowledge systems and institutions include people, places, processes, relations, uh, and the cultural biotic and other products uh, of the interaction between and amongst these factors. Second, traditional knowledge systems and institutions not only produce, transmit, and perpetuate knowledge and the products thereof, they also integrate uh, such knowledge into the values, customary practices, ceremonies, physical, genetic, and cultural identity of Native societies. Third, as both derivations and manifestation of the unique identity, autonomy, and places of indigenous peoples. Traditional knowledge systems and, institutional, and institutions to us are these essential elements of nationhood and nation building, uh, which is frankly what the Institute is about. And, and finally, uh, it's about contesting claims to cultural supremacy. You know, you're not going to be the boss and we're going to be the hoss. This is going to be a, a level playing field uh, where we have just as much right, indeed an obligation and responsibility to delineate uh, those spaces uh, uh, wherein uh, and define the terms whereby our system, our knowledge systems and mainstream science can be synthesized or hybridized. All right. 
And as I said earlier, I love this film. I really love this film. Uh, I love it because it portrays a community that believes, thinks, and acts systemically and holistically. You see, you see uh, folks have a choice. They can simply choose to be a, uh, uh, a strand, a, a, a thread in this complex web of interrelated activities, laws, policies, practices, and institutions, right? Uh, but these communities have chosen not to simply to be uh, one of those threads. They have chosen instead to be the weaver. Uh, and in my view, they have chosen to be nation builders. Uh, so that's the important, uh, important element of this, uh, uh, this film that really re resonates uh, with what we do here at the Institute. So let's start off with a question to Ira and, and Jonathan, all right? Working here, my experience has been, you know, believing, thinking, and acting systemically is not easy. And a lot of pressures that, uh, that uh, try to render uh, communities asunder. There are myriad reasons for community members to think and act selfishly in their own self-interest. So the questions I have, we all, are, are, are what are the social cultural processes uh, in those communities that preserve and foster these notions of community. Similarly, what are the challenges, some of the challenges to community-ness? And then finally, how can international, federal, state, educational and scientific institutions help advance communityness. Well, um, it's a very complex question. Hello, everybody. My name is Jonathan Barbieri. This is Gira Vallejo, my wife and co-producer of the film. Um, first of all, let me just say that, you know, wow, we're really, really happy to be able to be on this platform to have the film create the ripple effect that it's having through you, um, because that was the full intention of ever even making a film in the first place. The idea was that we saw, I've been living here in Oaxaca for 35 years, I should say, and Yura has been living here for 10 years. And we saw that um, this uh, uh, the interchange this, inner, this, this seed exchange that Yida will tell you about a little bit later on, uh, which has been going on for thousands of years here in Oaxaca and across Southern Mexico, um, <clears throat> it represents a model, a model that could be theoretically uh, adopted by uh, other communities. We saw, and, and when we involved Gustavo Vasquez, the director of the film, who's an old friend, friend of mine from all the way back to art school, um, and who is an independent filmmaker and uh, uh, teaches film uh, at the University of Santa Cruz, uh, of California, Santa Cruz. When we all got together about this, our primal message was that this model or variations on the theme of this model could actually serve for other communities. And that was the premise. So uh, I would say that, uh, first of all, uh, you know, if we can address the third part of your question, <clears throat> which is how can state and, and, and international and, and scientific and education and all of these different uh, sort of institutional uh, 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 participants um, collaborate to, to make this, this model or 
variations on the theme of this model more accessible, accessible to other communities. I think, and, and film the film that we did is precisely for that purpose. Uh, I would say that the answer is we're all in this together and it doesn't matter who you are, what nationality you are, whether you're indigenous, whether you're um, uh, in, in whatever sector of whatever country, we're all in this together. And so the need to collaborate is, is an imperative right now. It's really important. The problem is that people don't see how they can, how they can do this, right? And part of the reason for making the film, and, and I hope that we at least address this to a certain extent, maybe we didn't do it well enough. The idea is to show people that yes, you know, you can collaborate with uh, local scientific institutions and, and, and institutions that are um, set up to, to preserve biodiversity and natural resources and things like that. You can do it, you can do it in your own country, in your own, country, in your own community. And uh, the film emphasizes, well, amongst other things, it emphasizes what we call a tequio. And a tequio is something that can occur completely natu naturally in the guise of a community garden, for example, in some urban setting, say Denver, for example. You know? uh, when you get people working together for the benefit of something larger than themselves, for be it 10 members or 20 members or 100 members, then uh, uh, you end up having some variation on the theme of tekyo. And tekyo, anthropologists like to use uh, to describe tekyo, the French term corvée labor or inscripted labor as if this is something that's you know, terrible, uh, which is almost on the verge of slave labor, right? But tekyo is really an honor. It's an honor to participate in your community. It's an honor to be part of what that community does and produces, right? And that's why Tekyo is at the heart of this film. And we'll talk about that a little bit more um, because this question is so complex that we need to you know, take it from sort of different, uh, different aspects and try to go deeper into those different um, uh, areas that the, the question addresses. Um, I think that one of the key things that makes communityness so easy to attain here is because it's been going on already for thousands of years. And for thousands of years, since the invention of corn, and let me just say this right now to get this out of the way, corn is an invention of human beings of indigenous scientists, the inter intellectual property for corn, for native corn, for these particular corns that we're talking about in the film, belong to the people who have shepherded that corn from the dawn of agriculture into the 20th century. And we have the Nagoya uh, Accords, which Mexico signed on to a few years back, which gives governments the opportunity to, in, 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 to, to legislate uh, 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 regulations, rules and regulations and laws and, and institutions to protect that corn. Mexico at the time did not have the legislation to do that so that the Nagoya protocols were actually toothless in Mexico until the Senate, until Susana Harp and, and uh, she's gonna help me. Um, until the Senate in April of 2020 passed Susana Rodriguez. Susana Rodriguez. Susana Rodriguez. Susana Rodriguez. Susana Rodriguez. Okay. Esa fue una falla de parte, pero mira, the thing is, is that as of April of 2020, Mexico is beginning to legislate, beginning to create the systems that will be necessary to protect native corn. Okay. Now, the other thing about native corn being an invention, being something that never before occurred in nature means that native corn naturally cannot reproduce itself. Native corn needs, and all corn for that matter, needs the vigorous intervention of human beings 
in order to propagate its genetic material, okay? And so the people who invented native corn and their, and their, and their um, the people that, that, that uh, came after them for 350 generations have brought that concept into the 21st century. Along the way, the concept was spread across the world. And corn in one form or another is growing practically in every single continent, except for maybe an Antarctica in the world. The point being that um, although there are all kinds of corn out there, there is a direct lineage to the original corns here in Oaxaca, which is one of the places where corn was invented. We have here a, a, a site called Gilanakits, which is uh, a set of caves, which was shown in the film, which in which the oldest vestiges of corn cultivation and storage were found in the 1960s. Um, the thing that really fascinated me when we began this process of making the film was the continuity, the fact that the people today are using the same methodologies and the same social and cultural uh, institutions such as Tekio to continue the work that was started 350 generations ago. That to me is astounding. Um, and other re kind of areas that have reconfirmed this for me are, for example, the fact that um, and because a friend of mine did an archaeological dig, dig in uh, Mapo Sochi, uh, which is a pottery community, uh, a pottery uh, producing community, he excavated homes that are 3,500 years old underneath the present day homes. And he found that the floor plans, the architect, architectonic architectural form, floor plans are the same today as they were 3,500 years ago. So that continuity to me is really important. So in a sense, the question, the second part of your question, which is, you know, <clears throat> it must be very hard to, uh, to keep community-ness going. Uh, my answer to that with respect to the communities here in Oaxaca, and I would say communities plural, because there are so many different communities and different languages spoken here, the answer to that is that it's, it's easy, actually. It's easy. It's been in existence for so long. And it's resisted encroachments from bad indigenous policies from the government, from the incursion of junk food and Coca-Cola and things like that. It's, in, it's resisted these things precisely because of corn. Now, what, what is the actual role of corn in all of this, aside from providing protein and carbohydrates. Uh, corn essentially provides a rhythm, a daily rhythm to life, because there are so many aspects to the processing of corn from the cultivation all the way through harvest, through uh, uh, actual chemical processing into food, through nixtamalización, which is a chemical process. Uh, all of that requires work, it requires labor, it requires intense, um, intense uh, commitment and love for the community. And so when you have a, a, this, this central product that has been part of the culture for so long, for probably more than 6,500 years, Representing that cultural axis, that, that daily routine for so many people in different communities, which are very diverse communities. I mean, here in Oaxaca, we have 16 different ethnic groups, 16 different officially recognized uh, languages. And according to the In Institute of Indigenous Tongues, 171 different indigenous tongues. And we have precisely because of the convoluted aspects of Oaxaca's topography, we have all these different little ecosystems, each one producing its own language and its own corn. But each one, each community is completely 
focused on the daily activity of turning corn into food. That's what it's all about. And you can build a cosmology. And as long as that cosmology is linked to earthly activities, that cosmology has meaning. If it suddenly or through time um, becomes unlinked to those uh, daily activities, then it becomes an abstraction. It might turn into a religion or it might turn into a nostalgia. And so how do you keep that cosmology uh, real? How do you do that? Well, you don't have to do it by force. You do it by commitment. You do it by the fact that you're proud to be part of a Zapotec or a Mistake community where your fathers and grandfathers, great grand grandfathers did this. And you may wish to go to university and bring back knowledge or go off into the world and do something else. But while you're there in that community, there are the daily shores. They're called daily shores. And those represent really the true heart of community. And when people do that together, here it's called tequio. It's not corvée labor. It's not conscripted labor. It's proud giving of yourself for the betterment of the community for something that's much bigger than your personal sphere. And, and that's what corn represents. That's why in the film, people say, it's our children. Or some other people say, it's our parents. Because it's this incredible lineage that has brought this continuity for people from the dawn of agriculture into the 21st century. That's, that's what to me was the most amazing aspect and what we hoped to show in the film. And, and, and then to show you know, the different ways in which that manifests within a community. Um, I think that Jira should probably talk now because I've been talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> about um, the fe community, the La Feria de Agrobio Universidad. Let me give you a little bit of an introduction. Um, my wife, Yera, and co-producer, uh, <clears throat> um, she, she came here early on when we became interested in corn and we began to go to the different uh, 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 seed exchanges around, around the state. These are seed exchanges which have been going on regionally for maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of years, in which people from one region or one village come together with people with other village, from other villages and exchange seeds, seeds and ideas. Now, oftentimes, and I've done a lot of talks about corn in the States, and I've seen that there's a, a great focus on the materialism of corn, on colors, textures, blue tortillas, things like that. And what people tend to leave out, at least in my experience in the States, is the other aspect, the fact that corn could not exist without human beings. And the human beings that created corn and brought corn here to this moment in time couldn't exist without corn. That symbiosis, symbiosis is often overlooked. And how that symbiosis has uh, been able to survive is related directly to the seed exchanges. So now we have tequils, and we have seed exchanges. <laughs> seed exchanges are like living almanacs. People go to a seed exchange to exchange knowledge. To say, I tried these seeds that you gave me last year. They did this, you know, and then we got this. And what do you think? And how did your, my seeds go in your place? And it's all about that. It's a living almanac. That's what a seed exchange is. And over the past, decade, in, uh, uh, Conabio the, and, and different, different government institutions have, their scientists really have taken these, these projects on as, as passion projects, have created a seed exchange at the foot of Villa Naquiz in a community uh, called the, how do you say The Hilo Union Zapata. And the seed exchange is now in its uh, 10th year and Yira became a member of the board of directors. So she could tell you a little bit about it. Hola a todos and gracias. Thank you for 
for inviting us. For us, it's very, very exciting to be part of this panel. So like Jonathan mentioned, about five or six years ago, we start going to, to this great event. And last year it was a 10th anniversary, but it was obviously canceled for, you know, for COVID. So hopefully this year it will happen. And it's a beautiful event that it's once a year. And it's an effort of different institutions. So you have Conavio that it's a National Council of Biodiversity. You have uh, CONAM, that is a National Council of uh, Protected Areas. You also have local uh, institutions and the most important uh, groups in the different in, in indigenous communities. So you have the authorities coming together and at this place that is Ejido Unión Zapata, that is like uh, the foothills of, of Gilanakit, so the main uh, caves were uh, the oldest vestiges of corn were found. And they invite about four to 500 campesinos, farmers. And it's just exactly at the end of harvest. So all the farmers, they come together and they exchange knowledge and also seeds. And they bring their families. So you, you go at this event and you'll see all the beautiful and colorful textiles that they have in their own villages. And then you listen to their different dialects and languages. So Spanish is barely spoken and it's beautiful. So they bring all the, the products that they harvest. So you see all these wonderful and beautiful colors of corn. You see all these herbs, you see some things that you have even never seen before. I remember one year that we saw these like tiny um, rice that they call it a frijol arroz. So it was like a mix between a bean and a rice. I'm like, wow. Yeah, it really and, it, and it was a bean, mm -hmm. but it was like tiny, tiny. And this farmer, he had only a few kilos to exchange. And it's wonderful to see, you know, that every year they come together and then they also recount what happened, you know, if the seed work in their land, if they um, have now, you know, a new seed that it, 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 it adapted to their own uh, village. So we start going there and we start supporting La Feria with, uh, you know, sometimes with um, like a, a bus or the, the music, you know, because they donations, usually- Donations, donations. they usually have, no no funds and they they're always struggling so we also we have been involved with the restaurant business since a long time because we we are in the besides you know producing the the, the documentary we are in the in the alcohol spirits in the wine spirits in the still spirit. so we we have all the chefs and all the cocineras tradicionales that we work together so we start inviting them because it was a very local event. And uh, even though it was very big, it was mainly for farmers. So all the people, you know, people in the food and wine industry, they start coming and it was beautiful, you know, to and share. They and they didn't know about it, but it was also very beautiful because one year, it was, I think, 2018, there were no funds, nothing, you know. And then- we It was an election them. year. It was crazy. So we actually helped, um, uh, to do a, a fundraiser and all the chefs, uh, tradi uh, cookers, tradicion uh, cocinas tradicionales from Oaxaca and also bartenders from Mexico City, they came together, you know, to do um, a beautiful event. And then we also had seminars about corn with INIFAP, that it's also one of the main institutions that it's, uh, um, that they have studied corn and uh, they gave like a very, very intense um, presentation about the different types of corn and the different types of use of corn. So it was beautiful. And um, the La Feria de la Agrobiodiversidad, for us, it was the inspiration to make this documentary. 
And I hope that everybody see the documentary because it's, it's beautiful and you learn a lot also. We are still learning. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. very, very much. Um, we got the... I'm going to ask uh, Sergio to unmute himself because uh, Merv has a, a question um, more along the lines of intellectual property, which is his expertise. Right. And I ran uh, the question uh, by uh, Sergio earlier, but uh, intellectual property rights, protected geographical indications, branding, certifications, and other mechanisms uh, uh, can be powerful tools to protect uh, a wide range of economic, social, cultural, and other community interests in traditional foods and crops. Uh, so what IPR and uh, related tools do you think could be used to protect and, and advance uh, these communities' uh, 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 interest uh, in in their in their corn, and if you have time, we'll ask the very difficult question. Uh, a second, very difficult question. Yes, well, uh, thanks for the invitation uh, once again. Uh, as uh, as Merv mentioned, I am an intellectual property uh, specialist, and uh, uh, the problem here is that uh, some questions that Merv raises are so complex and so uh, uh, difficult to answer that may require uh, the study of uh, or, or the preparation of a thesis in a doctorate degree. So uh, please, uh, uh, in the first instance, uh, apologies for my lack of time as well as of my lack of sufficient words to explain all this situation, uh, all the, uh, the different uh, ways that uh, we may have. And I may even uh, confess that I think that I, I, I don't have all the questions and uh, mostly mostly important i think I, I was listening very carefully jonathan as well as as uh, jira and uh, i believe that uh, there are not uh, specific answers there are not only answers and that they are not uh, one only one answer uh, saying that, uh, I, I before answering the, your question, Merv, let me uh, let me confess to that I am very amazed because this is the first time in in all my life that I I am saying that in the analysis of uh, uh, of a motion picture uh, there is uh, a. An there are inquiries in regard to intellectual property, not in regard to the to the film, not in regard to, to the motion picture, but in the contents and how to solve the problem established, the problem de uh, described in the in the in the work. I think this is very very attractive as well as well of course immediately that called my attention and uh, um, both, once again thank you for the invitation uh, the intellectual property rights are, uh, uh, are are very open to different protection of the of, of the knowledge of, of people uh, so there are different uh, um, elements are different tools to solve this. Uh, first of all, as as long as uh, when I was watching the the movie, uh, immediately immediately I thought in the um, uh, vegetal varieties. It's a, a special um, tool from or a special mechanism uh, uh, in uh, inter industrial property rights. Uh, it well, it's uh, ruled by UPOV in indeed uh, the United States as well as Mexico. I'm, I'm from Mexico. Uh, um, the, both countries as well as many other countries are part of the UPOV uh, uh, agreement. And uh, the, the, idea, the idea here is that uh, as a general rule the the living the the, the living plants uh, the, the the animals the, the, the people the persons are not cannot be protected by patents uh, this, a, this is the general rule uh, so there are some uh, some exceptions but the 
uh, and the rule here is that if you want to protect a plant, uh, you need to go to uh, to protect through uh, through vegetal varieties. Uh, it's very interesting that in I may say that Mexico is uh, in all the world the country that has uh, protected more different varieties in regard to corn. And, uh, and this is because of course uh, uh, there are of course other um, brothers, other neighbor countries and that also um, lives around the corn. But I may say that Mexico it, it's one of the most important uh, um, elements of food, elements of life. So uh, the, uh, since time ago in Mexico, we have been uh, playing with different ways to to obtain better products, a more uh, more efficient, um, maybe more tasty, more attractive to to the to the taste, to the to, to the look, etc. And uh, uh, that's uh, the first instance that uh, it is possible to protect. Uh, also. Uh, of course, there are in a specific ways there are, that could be some protection through patents. I, I believe that some patents may be uh, used to protect. But once again, here it's a, a, a very challenging situation because once again, I, as I said, uh, in Mexico, the, the rule, the, the law ban all the the in a, in a general rule uh, ban the the patents in regard to living so um uh, however for example some processes or some uh, elements of the of, in this case of the corn may be patent or or some processes to obtain a, a better product or some processes for example when we are um, playing or, or when we are an, uh, investigating with the, the DNA of the yeah. of the corn it, it can be occur could be patent that's another option uh, likewise and that's the, the main reason because you reach me in the first instance there is another tool a very interesting tool that unfortunately here in mexico is not so well developed but it's the the uh, geographical indications as well as the designations of origin uh, it could be also protected uh, but uh, in this case it's uh, also a very interesting point uh, the idea here is to protect the special the, the, the specific characteristics of that corn that it's raised that it's uh, produced in a specific sector, in a specific area. So uh, if this area has so very uh, unique characteristics uh, in the geographical as well as in the weather, as well as in the in the soil uh, uh, elements, uh, could be protected as, uh, in my point of view, as a designation of origin. Uh, let me, let me, I tell you all the audience as well as as uh, Jan, Merv, uh, and Jira and Jonathan that uh, I it's, it's very it's a casual situation but I am helping right now uh, several producers of mezcal uh, in regard to the use of the appellation or the designation of origin mezcal that it is uh, used to protect uh, a spirit made by agave and in fact right now I am drinking here a coffee that also it, it's also protected by a uh, designation of origin it's uh, it's the most uh, the, the newest designation of origin here in mexico that it's Pluma. Pluma, yeah. that's right it's it's a coffee pluma in the area of uh, of pluma in, in oaxaca in oaxaca and uh, so i am I, i'm a huge fan of the designations of origin i think uh, once again it's not uh, a very uh, well used uh, and as, as well as a very well understood a uh, tool uh, uh, by the authorities here in Mexico, as well as by the people. But it's a very, very interesting uh, way to protect. I know that uh, in this case, in the United States, uh, 
there is no uh, the, the the United States does not like geographical indications as well yeah. as uh, designations of origin. But uh, in the meantime, uh, I may say that uh, as you say, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there is another way to protect uh, in that it's the uh, those trademarks, those uh, those certification or. Um, uh, well, some some trademarks that may be uh, protected, maybe by the uh, by the regulatory council or even by the Mexican government, in order to protect that appellation or that uh, designation of origin or geographical indication as a trademark. Uh, I have good friends at the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and I know that the the, the official position of the U.S. government is that you don't like. Uh, geographical indications or designations of origin and it's very clear that in the next years uh, there will not be a, a change of mind in that way however uh, i think that uh, as an attorney maybe the idea here is not to how to challenge or, or how to defeat this but how to live with the tools that the government that the the, the law gives to us so uh, as i said uh, geographical indications appellations of origin in, uh, in in lots of countries are they they are valid uh, uh, tools or, uh, or or trademarks also in practically in all the world it is possible to obtain uh, protections through um, uh, th through trademarks uh, in some cases uh, in very specific cases uh, patents could be used too and uh, uh, and uh, as i said and i have not seen this concept well developed but also the 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 the, the vegetal vari varieties system it's also a, a very good tool to to be used so uh, i think we have lots of tools and uh, as a uh, as a closing mark, I may say that the problem here is not the lack of tools, but the lack of support, the lack of uh, legal support to the producers, uh, as well as the education. Uh, I think that understanding, in the case of, of Mezcal, I may say that there are some producers of Mezcal that they don't, uh, by now, they don't understand very well why it's so important the designation of origin mezcal and uh, i have a good friend uh, she she's related to the european union uh, entity and uh, uh, as uh, as comment uh, she mentioned that in some travels that she did to to veracruz or to chiapas that are other two states here in mexico uh, she asked to to many people about uh, for example cafe de chiapas or Café de Veracruz, and most of the producers, they don't care about the, this designation of origin. So I think that the tools are there, but we have two big problems to be solved. One is the, the education of the people in order to let them know that this is a helpful tool to keep their, their intellectual property rights. And the other one is to have sufficient um, advice a legal advice in order to to let the people go to the to this protection unfortunately in this case i, I may say the, that the mexican government uh, this, in, in, despite they are doing very well uh, in regard for example of uh, of uh, trademarks uh, advising uh, in, in regard of other tools as uh, designations of origin or as uh, vegetal varieties i think there are some lacks of, of information or the the people uh, don't don't find how to to reach uh, this uh, this uh, um, advising and uh, unfortunately too and I, I must be very careful in this but i may say that uh, even inside the government i don't have i i, I will not say uh, agencies as well as names specific agencies or, or names but i know that some of them are not really well prepared to 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 to, ass to assist 
them. So it's a it's an issue that it's uh, sometimes takes out my dream my my sleeping because I think it, it's a very difficult it's a very challenging uh, solution to to find. Uh, and uh, well, I, I don't know. Uh, as I said, sorry for the lack of words as well as the, the lack of timing, but it's a very challenging, a very difficult question. Yes, you you raise a, a, a very interesting uh, point, Sergio, and it, uh, well, a couple of interesting points. Uh, one is given the uh, uh, the. Uh, that the Indian tribes here in the United States are recognized as sovereign governments. My thought had always been, you know, promulgate the rules, establish the laws uh, that would, using, for example, designations of origin, uh, protective geographic indication. Uh, for, for your own tribe. No. Because there's nothing right now that establishes that base. There's, there's nothing there that says these are ours and these are ours because of these characteristics, uh, because of the soil, because of how we cultivate, etc. Mm -hmm. All of those things uh, that were kind of documented in the, uh, in the film, but, but if we can do that, uh, then perhaps we can start uh, commanding a, a price based on, on quality, mm -hmm. on uh, you know, concerns about uh, human rights, etc. Relatedly, I the idea of uh, of certifications uh, doesn't necessarily require governmental uh, you know approval. Right? Mm -hmm. As associations can establish their own certifications, their own brands, etc. Uh, and, and again. It's a way of, uh, to my uh, uh, way of thinking, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, one is establishing your right to uh, the product mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, perhaps commanding a higher price based on uh, the equivalent uh, establish equivalence uh, with the certification with higher quality. Well, it's uh, once again a, a very difficult and complex uh, position. Uh, I may say that uh, uh, even Jonathan mentioned that here in Mexico we have uh, many uh, many communities that are under the rules of usos y costumbres. That means the uses as cust and customs that are more or less similar that the tribes in the United States. It's uh, a local government. However, here the problem is not to to, to live locally but the problem is i, I may say it, uh, the idea here is maybe live locally but uh, you need to, uh, to to find the the, the proper rules the proper ways uh, to uh, to also have the, the contact with other communities as well as with the federal government as well with local governments etc and maybe inside the community in one community in, in Oaxaca for example it could work but uh, here the problem is that you need uh, also to be in touch and you, you have relationships economical relationships businesses with the uh, other communities as well with uh, as, as the federal government as uh, the uh, local government 
governments uh, in Mexico, and even I may say, uh, maybe some products are so fantastic that may uh, need to be uh, also managed in, in in an international fashion, in an international point of view. So it's not easy to 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 answer that. And uh, I may say that there is another way that maybe we can. Uh, use, uh, you, uh, listen to you, Merv, uh, the protection to the consumer. Here in Mexico, uh, I, I, I know that in the United States is also well uh, developed the protection to the consumer, but here in Mexico, even there is a, a strong, uh, not maybe not strong enough, but a, a, a strong agency, a federal agency that keeps the protection to the to the uh, the protection of the of the consumers so maybe in this point of view we may find another options uh, in order to, uh, to avoid the exception of the of the general people uh, and when they say maybe this product becomes from the community of uh, a, a certain community in wax in oaxaca for example then uh, uh, avoid uh, through the the rules, through the laws uh, of protection of the consumers, to avoid the the deception of the consumers. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm making sense with this. No. Uh, the idea here is to avoid to other people claim that the product becomes from a certain place uh, and uh, make you think that you are helping this community and that you have a, a, maybe a. a, a a more uh, traditional product and uh, you are finally are deceptive because uh, this is not true so maybe this is another option it's not well explored but uh, it is also an another option maybe it's not precisely intellectual property rights it's consumer rights but uh, it's another option and i am thinking on this when i listen to your question merv i don't know if this uh, more or less answer to your to, to your point uh, it, it does. But as you said, <laughs> these are really uh, complex issues and very yes. complicated. Uh, and unfortunately, we have to wrap up now. So uh, I'd like to, if it's possible, to interject something before we do wrap up. Sure, we have um, a few minutes. Go ahead. I think that the idea of approaching this from a government top down approach is antithetical to what this is all about. Mm -hmm. I think that to create laws is fine and hopefully that will happen at some point, although we don't know which way uh, the coin is going to fall, right? Whether it's gonna be beneficial for communities or not, because that's beyond our control. Government is beyond our control, let's just yes. face that. Secondly, this top-down approach, of it, it uh, omits the most important part, which is the daily labor and the creating of the product. Now, we have experienced and witnessed people taking corn from communities in Oaxaca and planting them in upstate New York, for example, and selling them as Oaxacan corn. But we also know that on a biological level, those seeds that they take from Oaxaca to plant in upstate New York in a different pH, soil pH, in, a, in different climates, in different seasons, it's not gonna last. It's just not going to last. Equally, as I've said many times, the corn that the people produce here in Oaxaca is the most contemporary, the most modern corn on earth. Corn that is produced, let's say Monsanto corn or or GMO corn, or hybrid corn from Sinaloa, or um, number, yellow dent number two corn from the United States, are corns that are frozen in time. They're frozen in time. And because they're frozen in time, they require fertilizers, herbicides, Roundup, glyphosate in order to survive, okay? So if you take corn from Oaxaca and grow it in upstate New York, you may get one miserable harvest, and then that's it. These are fundamental rules of nature and community. You can't legislate from the top down and expect that you're gonna to solve problems. It's 
The problems have to be solved by the communities, see? And in the situation that you have there in the United States, which is um, the American Indian nations have come, have been forced to, to live very close together now and have this possibility of interchanging ideas and have this possibility of working together, right? There is a, a really, really strong potential there to start with community gardens, to start with tekios, that means everybody's working together for a common goal, right? And to, first of all, prove that you have something. I mean, people in the States around Thanksgiving or Halloween, they buy Indian corn, as they call it. And it's some sort of nostalgia. We're not talking about some nostalgic product. We're not talking about the past. We're talking about the future. The corn that, produce, that, that Oaxacan communities produce today or that are produced in the state of Mexico or in Michoacan are the future of corn. They are the future of corn. These native indigenous scientists are producing the corn of the future. Or the corn that is also produced in Peru or, or in the yeah. native communities in, in yeah. the US. So that, so that it, it, just to conclude, there was one thing that was mentioned here that Sergio really touched on that, that is actually really, you know what's going on, you know it's really current, and that is certification. Communities can certify, and that's something that's, that's a burgeoning process that people are working on here in Oaxaca, that communities can certify, and thereby you as the consumer of say in the States can know that this has got the certification I'm getting together. from, you know, That's from this, this town. Now, there's also the other issue that was raised in the film. It was a current events issue. It was actually, we had to sort of divert our, our trajectory in order to cover that issue, which was the, the Oloton corn that supposedly was taken from Toton de Peque uh, in the Sierra Mije and brought to uh, uh, Madison, Wisconsin and to uh, Davis, California, right? In which there, there's no, I mean, they, the way they see it is that, oh, these land-raised corns grew up by themselves. There was like, you know, they grew up in these harsh environments and developed by themselves this, um, these aerial roots with this uh, uh, bacteria that, that, uh, that yeah. helps them produce nitrogen. This is a falsehood. Yeah, let me, let me, let me, let me inter interrupt a second. That's exactly the point of these designations of origin, et cetera. Well, okay, okay. But, but, that, but, that but, is, that is to say, it is not a top down thing. It is from the community and says, this product exists only by dint of our expertise, our history, our land, our biota. Yes, that, that's, that. that's, that's how it should be. But the problem with that is the following. As Flavio Aragon says in the film, yep. Oloton is not only from Totontepec. It grows from Guatemala to the Sierra Norte. It, it's, there are uh, like 500 yep. communities that grow it. And so how exactly. did this community and get to be 500 seven? different kinds of designations of origin. You well, see, that's, well, that's, what the to me the beauty of these type of uh, mechanisms is that they can be customized that's They're true very local and and grassroots is the answer grassroots is the answer that that's exactly what to me that is what enables grassroots folks to come together and say this is ours i think i think that grassroots people come together in spite of that and and, and before it happens and well, the fact we're, is that we're, the we're did to, not have exclu exclusive rights to sell that corn to UC Davis. Well, and I think a great example of a grassroots well, community sell. is the Indigenous Film Festival that we're in right now. <laughs> uh, look at that. If you would like to support <laughs> uh, Yeah, there you go. A good transition. Uh, Thank you, thank you to all of our panelists for an amazing uh, discussion. I hate yeah. to be the bad guy and break it up. Oh, yeah. oh, they're like a very bad, the bad guy. <laughs> we love you guys. We love you guys at the, at the museum. We love the panelists. <laughs> and we love Gabby.
And, thank you. And if thank you, you like Marv. Donate, please, 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 please go in. Gracias, um, gracias. I just put a link in the chat uh, for the virtual donation bucket. For those of you that were here before the pandemic, there used to be a literal bucket that you could add any additional uh, funds that you had to be able to support this festival and the films getting to folks like you all here. I just added a link in the chat. Um, it's a virtual bucket. It doesn't clink, but uh, you know it still feels great to be able to support an amazing organization. <laughs> Uh, the other thing I'm going to go ahead and add in the chat before we go is we hope to see you all on February 9th uh, for another in, um, another film. I just added the link to register in that. But we are over time. Uh, it will, I'll let everybody wave goodbye. Uh, thank you. One, one quick thing. Sergio, if you see Audrey, tell her I said hi, okay? Yes, <laughs> of course, yes. Sergio, Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Claro que sí. Encantado, a sus órdenes. Qué, qué gusto, ¿eh? Feliz año. Igualmente. Gracias a todos. Hasta luego. Everybody. Gracias. Bye bye. Hasta luego.